Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again through the live stream. As Mark said, the topic is uh, what was labeled as session 20 in the Behold a Man series on sadness and sorrows. In particular, it's from, <clears throat> excuse me, from part four, counsels concerning some ordinary temptations in um, Francis de Sales' introduction to the de devout life. Before we begin, please join me in a, in a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth, amen. Today we're going to cover uh, chapters 412 through 415. I want you to notice for a moment, please, the section of the book that we're going over, Ordinary Temptations. The implication here is that most people will experience one or all of the temptations noted within that section of the book, and in particular, uh, ones that we'll speak about today. So expect it. It's part of the limited arsenal that the evil one has to overcome it. He's going to come after us with it, be ready, it's coming. Um, we're in it. We have a battle right now that certainly can engender sadness and sorrow. So, chapter 412, the particular chapter on sadness and sorrow. So we begin by thinking about sorrow produces two good effects. It actually does. One, it can give us uh, an idea in, in looking into the idea of compassion to feel with, to feel for, to have uh, concerns about other people. And the second good effect would be to bring upon us a sense of repentance. Because as we experience the sorrow, we look inside and we see what is going on and what could we have done to cause this sorrow, this healthy emotion that we, we is evoked in us when uh, some bad thing happens. So, compassion and repentance, good effects. Francis calls to mind six evil effects uh, of sorrow and sadness, and the first of, one of them is anxiety, that sense of foreboding, that sense of being uh, out of control and not fully aware of what's going on. The second one he brings up is sloth, the unwillingness to move forward, uh, to languish, to be afraid. Um, interestingly enough, uh, sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. A third one is wrath, uh, that sense of anger, that sense of desiring to conquer something, to overcome something, to destroy something because you've been affected emotionally. Again, interestingly enough, another one of the seven deadly sins. Jealousy is the third. Jealousy um, that, oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, jealousy is the fourth. Jealousy, another form uh, of the seven deadly sins, uh, which specifically are greed or lust, but jealousy that, that gut feeling that somebody has something better than you you're in a tough strait, and consequently, uh, you feel this uh, desire to get even or to d want what they have. Uh, another of the uh, evil effects, the fifth one, is envy. Um, that burning within you similar to jealousy that, again, more people are getting better than you, more than you, and you want what they have. Uh, again, 
envy, another one of the seven deadly sins. So, so far, five of these evil effects and four of them are the seven deadly sins. Amazing how something like sadness and sorrow could be so potent in its effect upon us. And the last one he calls to mind is impatience. That shortness of temper we get when we're not feeling well, when we want uh, things to be better and we want them better now. Like right now, we want this better now. We can be impatient. So six effects uh, for sorrow. Um, what Francis says is the evil one uses sorrow to set temptations before good people. He tries to make good people grieve uh, over their virtues. So we do good stuff and we expect good stuff in return. We do good deeds and we expect our works to evoke immediate rewards. It doesn't always happen that way. And so that sorrow or sadness weaves its, itself into our hearts and spirits to drive us to doing the seven deadly sins, those envious and wrathful behaviors that weave themselves into our souls. And that's what he gets to when he moves on to say that by means of sorrow, the evil one then disturbs our soul. He upsets us. He disorients us. He arouses inordinate fears. He causes us to think things that are more problematic than they really are, that perhaps God isn't really in charge and is going to overcome these circumstances. He creates within us, uh, again, by means of sorrow, this sense of disgust for our relationship with God and our lack of willingness to relate with him and to come to him in prayer. He stupefies us. He makes our thinking cloudy. He disorients us. He destroys a sense of prudence. Again, why would we become slothful if we won't pursue those daily tasks, those ordered tasks that we know our lives need to have to make it through what it is we need to accomplish this moment? Benedict Groeschel used to say, the next best thing. What we need to do is momentarily do the next best thing. Francis goes on to say that this sorrow takes away the sweetness from our soul. We lose that lovely taste, that sense of joy in life. And he says it renders the soul disabled and impotent in, in its faculties. That is to relate one to one all the social distancing, what it is doing to our vision of other people who stand before us as sons and daughters of God. Are not our visions being impacted? I know mine is. And I have to work hard at seeing the other, not as a virus carrier, but as a son or daughter of God. So then what are the remedies to this? He puts forth these items. First, prayer. Steadfast, daily relationship with our God. Hold on to him. He is our joy and consolation. He tells us to use words of affection that bring us confidence to God. We love, we honor, we, we rejoice. Persevere in our good works. Hold fast to that which we know must be done. Serve with joy. Give, die to self. Sing, sing spiritual canticles. For the evil one runs away from the, the, the praises of God. He can't stand it. So raise a, a holy voice to our loving God. Occupy yourselves with exterior works and bury them as much as possible. Keep busy. An idle mind is the devil's workplace, it's been said. So keep busy. Perform fer fervent external actions, even though you don't feel good about it, even though they may be without relish. You see, the heart motive, as it is in today's parlance, is not the end all and be all. That we act with honor and integrity every moment, even when we're fighting our belly because we want to lash out. When we act with honor and integrity, that 
act of the will brings glory to God. He talks about corporal mortifications. In other words, suffer. Suffer well. Suffer honorably. You will. You're going to be there. You're, we're being dragged there now. So suffer with grace. Be humble. Admit that these are struggles. Admit it to your confessor. Admit it perhaps to a dear friend with whom you can relate well. Admit that this is tough and honorably tough it out. And don't doubt. In the end, don't doubt. God's plan is being played out. He's not unaware of what's going on. This is certainly within his permissive will. And so we must journey through this well. On 413, Francis changes now to talking about spiritual and sensible consolation and how to receive them. And so he goes on to say that, look, there are ups and downs in life. God conserves this great world in existence amid constant change. Life is defined as objects that are changing. Um, a being is known to be alive when it changes. When you die, your body stops changing. It just sits there. So we must try to keep our hearts on an equitable level. We must try to keep it balanced. We must realize that God is, in fact, charge. And during such times of uh, unbalance and inequality of events and circumstances, our hearts, our minds, focused on the true, unchanging, immutable God who is guiding us as we journey through this life. We must never um, forsake God in these times of apparent unbalance, for he is unchangeable. So then, he goes on to talk specifically about the sensible consolations, those times when we feel the spirit being with us. <clears throat> What he says is they aren't exactly the same as true devotion because he says many souls experience tender feelings but can still be nasty. So just because you're feeling good about God's presence, you can still be nasty and not fully, not fully embracing the love that God wants to pour out through you. Um, he says that these consolations are tricks played by the enemy to divert souls from the search for true devotion. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, he says that at times they issue forth from a soft nature susceptible to such impressions. In other words, we can wind ourselves up to believing that God is specifically blessing us at this moment in time with this sensation, with this feeling. He says, they have value. In fact, God brings us consolations. They can come, and, they, and should they be true, they will strengthen the soul and give it a holy joy, um, a joy in, its, in the soul's devotion, in that pursuit of God himself. And he says that they are, in fact, foretastes of the immortal delights that God gives to souls that both seek him and find him. So how do we distinguish between that good and bad that exists within the realm of consolation? We measure it by their fruit. We discern. We look to see what is it doing within us? What is this consolation doing within us? Is it producing virtue? Or is it producing vice? I'm getting a word from God. Uh, you should listen to me. Would that really, in fact, be a beneficial consolation? Probably not. But if your consolation is causing you to serve with greater humility, with greater love, uh, then perhaps we might see that that consolation is, in fact, from God. So then, how do we use these consolations? First, be humble about them. Recognize that they are truly gift, nothing you deserve. 
any more than your life or anything else. Gift from God to sustain you, to give to the body of Christ. Acknowledge, acknowledge, he says, that we are little children who still need the milk of consolation. In other words, consolation is, some, is for someone whose true ability to be devoted may not be as developed as it ought. But rather, um, you still need that milk uh, rather than solid food. He says, let us esteem these favors, no, not so much for what they are, but for rather who the giver is, that God is the author of this gift to you, for you, for the body, to serve the world. He says, kiss the hand, adore the hand, love the hand of him who gives it to you. And through the receiving of the gift, declare that it's not the gift that we're looking for, but the giver. We want him himself. We want God himself and his holy love. And so when, when and if you experience such consolations, bring them to your confessor or to a dear friend and work through them so that you might sort out their, their uh, source. Now he talks in 414 to the opposite side of consolation, and that's dryness and spiritual ba uh, barrenness. And so we go, he goes on to speak about sometimes you're going to find yourself deprived and destitute of all feelings of devotion. It's going to happen most likely. And so at this is a, great, a time of great danger because there is pain. It does hurt to feel disconnected from God, to think that God has abandoned you. And worse still, is this is when the evil one and the tempter sent to tempt your soul uh, creates an effort to drive you to despair, to enhance the feelings rather than the reason, to muddle the mind so that you're not more uh, in Con and continuity with that devotional relationship you have with God. So what do you do? What do you do in these circumstances? Well, first, we have to find out why this dryness is going on. We have to presume that there is the possibility that there is some behavior in our life that has caused this barrenness? Is there a sin? Is there an attitude? Is there a behavior that is causing us to be separated from God? If there is, acknowledge, confess, and move on. Move on to that holiness. Um, is the reason for this lack of consolation? Because when we were given consolations, we failed to use them. At the time, they were given to us. Um, he talks about, is there an unwillingness to give up sensual pleasures and the fleeting consolations that allow us to follow unhesitatingly towards God's information, invitation to, to come to the spiritual exercises. What that means is, as we are drawn more deeply into our relationship with God, some of the things that we used to do that we used to like and or may be beneficial will begin to take on less importance. Are we willing to give those up? Have we become duplicitous in our confessions and our spiritual communications with others and with God? Uh, have we put up barriers? Again, we can boil that all down to sinful behaviors. But in particular, as we look at these things, he asks us to look with some degree of specificity as to what these behaviors might be that are hindering our barrenness or that are hindering our consolations from God. Um, a couple more. Are we steeped in ourselves and in worldly pleasures? Um, and when we do receive consolations, uh, are we failing to use them to advance in virtue? Or are we bragging about it? 
So he goes on to say, okay, you need to look at this, but be careful. Don't go into this analysis with too much detail, nor be anxious about it. Again, less emotion, more reason. If, in fact, you are doing these things, okay. Acknowledge it, get on with it, confess it, and move on. And finally, there is certainly the possibility if you don't discover a cause, if, in fact, God is removing that presence from you for great healing. St. Teresa of Calcutta, it's said that she spent 50 years in a state of barrenness. Is that, exact, is that number exactly correct? No, but it is for sure that several of the last few years of her life, she lived in a, a state of barrenness, yet she died to herself and served. That's the point. She died to herself and served. So then, again, if you don't discover a particular cause, humble yourself before God in recognition of your nothingness. All you have is God's gift. It's all from him. If he chooses for a time not to gift you that particular way, you still have the gift of your life, your family, ad infinitum as to what you do have. Call on God all the more and beg him for the comfort of his presence. Open your heart to your confessor. Confess what's going on and pray for the gifts of the church and Holy Mother that she brings to us in the sacraments. Interestingly enough, he says, don't desire for that feeling, that barrenness to go away, but rather embrace it. For it is the will of God at this time. And if, in fact, you're pursuing the will of God, it's here. He's not, apparently. Realistically, could you possibly even exist if his presence wasn't fully in your heart? Absolutely not. You could not. And so this apparent barrenness is meant for your good. Embrace it. And don't lose courage. In fact, multiply your good works. Keep up your spiritual exercises. Beat whatever it is that is keeping God away, away. Beat it up by your desire for the giver, not the gift. And so finally in chapter 415, um, a illustration is given. I will be quoting a few quotes from uh, the introduction. It's a quick story about Geoffrey of Perone, uh, a, a monk recruit, as it were, uh, postulant, perhaps at the time that this story goes on, to uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And in this example, we find a sort of a pattern of dryness. And so I'll be quoting here directly from uh, Francis's book. The first quote. God usually gives a foretaste of heavenly delights, i.e. consolations, to those who enter his service, to detach them from earthly pleasures and encourage them in the pursuit of divine love, like a mother who honeys her breasts to entice her child. A second quote. It is this same God who sometimes, in his wise providence, deprives us of the milk and honey of consolation so that, having been weaned, we may learn to eat the dry but more solid food of a vigorous devotion. Again, another quote, sometimes great storms arise in the midst of such desolation. At such times, we must fight constantly against temptations for these do not come from God, but we must bear patiently with the sense of dryness as ordained by God for our advancement. A quick note on that particular quote. What we took away from this is that we need to distinguish between the temptations within dryness and dryness itself. See, dryness itself is not a temptation. It is an absence. But dryness is an environment in which temptations may arise. Just, interestingly enough, if you remember, consolation 
is an environment in which temptations may arise. Back to a quotation here from, and uh, there's two more if you'd in, indulge me here, um, to a quotation from the introduction. Quote, we must never lose courage or say, I shall never be happy again, for in the night we must await the dawn. On the other hand, no matter how fair the weather in our spiritual life, we must never say, I shall never experience sorrow again. Finally, the last quote, the best remedy is to reveal our trouble to some spiritual friend who can console us. So in the story, again, back to the book, a couple more items. In the story, when St. Bernard was apprised of the sorrow, his, of the struggle his friend Jeffrey was having, he offered no intervention. He offered no counseling. But what he did do is go to God. He prayed for Jeffrey. He prayed that he would grow in wisdom. He prayed that God would intervene for his beloved son, God's beloved son. And so we learn from that that consolation sometimes in times of trouble is not always intervention in counsel, as is the vogue right now on TV, but consolation, um, support in times of trouble is prayer. Always we pray. There is one other point that he makes that um, should apply in times of dryness is that um, there are physical factors, fatigue, anxiety, um, rest, good health. All of those matter. We are body and soul. Oh, by the way, Geoffrey of Peron would go on to be offered the bishopric of Tournai in Belgium and be elevated to the rank of the blessed in the church triumphant. And so, blessed Geoffrey of Peron, pray for us. In quick summary, in this fallen world, we will have temptations. It is a certainty. Don't be surprised by them. Be ready to face them and overcome them. Second, our emotions are intended to inform our will, not rule it. Embrace your emotions and identify them, but manage them and control your response by analysis with through reason in your will. And lastly, seek neither for excess or insufficiency. Equanimity, balance, allows us to progress steadily on the path to heaven. But whatever comes, know that God has his loving hand on your life and is guiding you home. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. On your stand.